Hi, my name's Rebecca. I'm a fish biologist, an ichthyologist and also a PhD student. I specialise and study the evolution of lorcard catfishes, which are also known as plecos, whiptail catfishes, otocinclus, etc. within the creme trade. And my research does involve these fishes and usually I work a lot with specimens, but sometimes I study behaviour. And today's video is going to be about one of those fishes and some fishes that are recently uh, rehomed and they're in this tank at the moment and are probably going to be moving around a little bit. So let's get into the video. So this video is going to focus on Planilocoria cryptodon, also known as the spoon-faced whiptail catfish. It's a monotypic genus, so there's only one species within the genus and that is Planilocoria cryptodon. It is related to others such as Pseudohemiodon, which is the chameleon whiptails. Um, so that's like Pseudohemiodon apothanos and AF apothanos tend to be the most common. Also some really rare ones such as Crossolocoria. And then a little bit more distantly related to Lorocaria, Hemiodon tichthys, and these other substrate dwelling Lorocarids. People don't often associate them with being plecos, but they are. And actually Lorocarichthys, which is very closely related and actually in this sort of group of substrate dwelling Lorocarids, is what Plecostomus was synonymised with. So these are kind of more Plecostomus than any of your hypensistrous or similar. So I'm going to kind of talk about how I set it or set up this tank and then also introducing and uh, showing me set um, introducing and acclimating the fish to the creme and how well they did with that. Uh, so let me get into that. So here I'm just draining the tank um, while also starting to remove some of that decor, kicking up some of the de uh, detritus and just waste anyway because that's gonna uh, ideally I would have not really have much in the tank but obviously most aquariums do and that's because I want more well the plan of the need more floor space and well it'd be beneficial for them to have it um, there was floor space anyway so I'm literally taking the larger bits of wood out while water changing and this just makes it a lot easier and you can see it kind of does disturb the fish a lot and people will say oh, why don't you switch off the lights I do actually need to be able to have a reasonable vision when I'm going in the tank to also not squish anything so it's mostly just taking out that large bits of wood and then the caves I can move while they're um, in the tank so I don't need to take them out and just think about placement because I don't want anything touching the glass and I don't want anything that could shift because the plan of it they're not that large but they could potentially shift caves and I don't want any risk of smashing the glass so as you can see it's just draining the tank people I might question large water changes I do 50% twice a week um, and it's getting towards winter so it is getting quite chilly from the tap so I'm trying to limit it a little bit and also removing any detritus I see or large build-ups but generally when I'm water changing I do tend to leave the tank alone a lot and just keep an eye on it because most of the time I don't need to siphon like that twice weekly and I'm just doing this to remove any fish waste any detritus anything that could cause um, well build up of just waste in general so once I've actually set up the whole tank is that's when I'm switching off the lights because that's when I'm going to start refilling it So just refilling the tank again and this is kind of similar so I've completely rescaped it's not really much of an axe to be honest but it's more functional so the fishes still have those hiding places and this I just add the C, uh, C -chem, C chem prime and then I just start to refill the tank I don't have enough tanks to bother or warrant using safe because it still does go out of date and this is when I tend to just leave the tank alone again. 
I do keep the filter running and the heaters because they're well below the waterline. But I will switch off the uh, wave maker just because um, I don't want it going under the water or out of the water, I guess is a better term. Um, and running dry which can harm it I will switch it back on to get circulating the temperature different so you don't get areas of really high temperature really areas of really low and I'll switch that on as soon as it's far enough below the water line and the heaters I do tend to keep in because they'll be starting to heat um, the aquarium and that's kind of what I want them to do so I am still walking around quite a bit, just doing other things at the same time because, well, water changes, I don't need to sit and watch it. I'm not using buckets, I am literally just refilling. And this can take, oh, about anywhere from half an hour onwards depending on the temperature just because I don't want it getting, if it's too cold, I don't want it decreasing too much. But ideally I don't want it too cold, but I just want that gradual change in temperature, even if it's probably quite rapid for the fishes. And you can see I did disturb the fishes quite a bit, but this is mostly the tetras moving around. Finally, onto the most. So finally onto the most exciting bit and this is actually unbagging the fishes or sort of acclimating. So I do plop and drop more um, but if I, I'm happy to float them for a little bit especially if I need to sort out things it just makes it a lot easier and a lot safer for them. So here I am literally just floating them for a little bit. The temperatures are wildly different. There'd be a little bit, but it's not enough to cause any issues. And anyway, if they were in a bag a long time, then it is actually better just to plop and drop because you're avoiding ammonium, converting to ammonia. And also any dripping or anything like that is stressful. It's all very short term, like sudden changes. So at the end of the day, there's kind of safer going back in, like directly into the tank. So here I'm doing a very simple just unbagging them or well opening the bag and just letting them in. So I do use my hands here, they're catfishes, nets are not a good idea if you can avoid it because some are venomous, these guys clearly aren't and they're not particularly sharp so they're not going to damage your hands, you don't need gloves. Um, but just lifting them and placing them in the tank and letting them swim away. I don't mix water, I don't uh, even if I know the water's safe from wherever I've got the fish, I don't want to mix water as a precaution anyway. So I'm just lifting them and placing them in very gently. And ideally lights out. I am not someone that blacks out the tank normally. I will do with like, well, discus and uh, pandoraru. But just literally keep it very calm. It's a very calm room. And just letting them in. Just a very quick video showing them just after I added them to a tank. So once settled in, this is them a few days later. So just the, as you can see, just the two planet Lucoria. Um, from this, I don't entirely remember which is male and which is female just from that. But I remember one is, has very different spotting to the other. And that's how, how I tell them apart. For some reason, some do have just different spotting. And they are quite active fishes. Um, I would say they are kind of social, but it's difficult to say. And sometimes there's a little bit of what could be aggression. And it's really just difficult to say because they are very different from a lot of other lower carids. So while most traditional plecos are detritivores and algivores, they are carnivores but they have very different anatomy to these guys. So these guys are mostly or most likely carnivores, potentially feeding on other things and seeds has been noted, but they are definitely, well, this species, this genus hasn't really been studied for parasites as much. The others can have quite high parasite loads of particular parasites associated with mollusks. So these guys I feed mostly invertebrates and while they've only been personally in my tank for uh, well less than a week I have worked with this pair 
for a lot longer and I have actually worked with these in the trade I just never really knew much or appreciated them as much as I should have so they do have very different oral anatomy to your traditional log code. They've got very small, very sparse teeth, if at all, on the upper jaw. These guys are swallowing that food and then crunching it later on with their frangial jaws. And they're quite interesting as they feed. You can see them using those barbels to actually search for the food. So they, I am aware they do have a little bit of damage and I think that's just from moving them fins in lower cards and fishes are quite delicate and this is also why I don't like using nets but it will heal really quickly and you can see how they use this dorsal fin probably for some communication and in that earlier footage on kind of a little bit of aggression. So Planilocoria as a fish um, you might be wondering about how would you actually keep them. They are, as substrate dwellers, they do need that substrate space. They do kind of climb a little bit over the decor, but they don't use it like other fishes. They are also not crevice spawners. Planetocoria are, they, well, they carry their eggs on their sort of barbels on their mouth and they're like a raft. So... They don't really utilise those caves and I don't really see them ever use crevices or caves. So therefore my other fish, which you can see are quite a few of the different lower cards are actually out on. Hypostomine, so we've got um, uh, four species of Ancestrus here, Decicera, Panaculus and Lassie and Cistrus. But, so that's for them and also it does create or break up the tank a little bit. Um, not just aesthetically, but for the um, Planinocoria. They can have a tank, I guess, of a lot more sand, but I have noticed they do sometimes like to spend time in the other part of the tank, and there's a small area, very little sand at the back, that they sometimes use. And this species, generally, you just want that area of substrate sand for them to bury, and they do bury, but not as much, I think, as Pseudohemiodon. These ones haven't really wanted to, and I do need to get a lot more sand for them. But also you could think about maybe adding leaf litter or something to break up the substrate in to provide different types of enrichment. They do seem to like a good amount of flow. They do, though they're sort of traditional law colours in some manners where they do produce a reasonable amount of waste. They do need a lot of flow. Um, and... I guess that's maybe where the similarities kind of change because they have a very different sort of habitat utilisation. They are largely carnivores as I've discussed and this means that a diet something like the Apache bottom scratcher, um, something invertebrate based but also feeding them snails and things like that would be beneficial. They aren't particularly predatory but they can be territorial with each other. I think I have a pair but I'm not entirely convinced they do tolerate each other, but have seen others really go for each other. But they're pretty hardy, actually. They do grow to around 30 centimetre standard length, so they're not short at all. And I'm kind of prepared for when they do grow a lot larger, because at the moment I'd say they're around 20 centimetre standard length. So they're not quite breeding size, and they might not be the most dimorphic at the moment, so I'm only a bit unsure whether I have a pair. But they're really interesting fishes if you like something different. If you want something smaller than Suda, um, Hemiodontichthys uh, aspensorinus uh, is a good choice if you can find it. This is a much smaller species, about I guess 10-15 um, centimetres standard length, probably more towards 15. And then there's also Lorcaria, and if you want something that does utilise uh, the decor a bit more, then there's Rhino Lorcaria. But there's a lot of different Lorcaria out there, or Lorcarinae, I mean, uh, out there that you can look into. They're, saying they're a little bit more active than Hypostomine, or they're a little bit more obvious. Hypostomine tend to be a lot more shy. These guys you can actually see... Um, and there's also the other more traditional ones like Phaloella, Stoosome and Stoosomichthys. Um, some are just a little bit more difficult to find and um, the large ones do tend to be a bit more expensive like Planeocoria and Pseudohemiodon are 
reaching between 70 to 100 pounds. Um, Hemiodontic, these can be anywhere from like 20 to 50. 50 is the highest I've ever seen them. And then also Lorcaria berries because most I've seen is about 100. Um, Rhino Lorcaria about 15 to 30. So it's not, they're not the cheapest but they're not the worst and these guys obviously haven't spawned yet but some people have spawned them um, Lorcaria as well, Pseudohemiodon so it's perfectly possible to do it, it's just not many people are keeping them because maybe the focus is more on Hypostomne which I really like both of them but in different ways so these are kind of like pet fishes for this tank whereas a lot of the other fishes I'm waiting to find others uh, for pairing for them because some of them I've only ever found one individual before. Um, so kind of like that tank has the Barry and Cistrus. These guys, they don't really like anything disturbing them. So anything that's going to be digging at the substrate, bothering them, geophagus, um, would be an issue and sometimes the larger cichlids. Uh, so that's what I'd really avoid housing them with, just anything that'll bother with them. Because they don't like being disturbed when they do, they do tend to spook a little bit. They're not a fish that you could just pick up and hold. They're not that sort of confident. They do spook. And they will spook sometimes when I switch on the lights, but I think they're getting used to me. Even though I've worked with this pair for over two years now. So they would be maybe about three, four years old, I think. I can't remember how big we, they were when I got them. Anyway, I'm going to end this video here. If you've got any questions, please ask. If you like my videos, please comment, like and subscribe. And don't forget we have a Discord server. And also I do have a TikTok um, channel if people are interested in more short form content, which is really easy for like factoid sort of things. So anyway, thank you for watching.